Are you an investigative professional? Did you know you can find the best private investigator resources using investigatorstoolbox.com? This resource community was built exclusively for licensed investigators and investigative professionals. You can network directly with members, educate yourself through free webinars and blogs, and even create your own customizable research library. Membership starts for as little as 49 cents a day. Download the Investigators Toolbox app or visit our webpage at www.investigators-toolbox.com. Is a good case management system keeping you from taking your business to the next level? Crosstrax is the premier case management system for the investigative community. They're the only SOC 2 certified case management software available. Visit Crosstracks.com, tell them you're a listener, and save even more. Get a plan in place for the new year to grow your business to the next level. Welcome to PI Perspectives. Our guest today is the amazing Marcy Phelps. Marcy is known in this industry as an expert in asset searches and due diligence. She speaks at conferences and has a great set of training videos. Today, we're talking about asset searches. So let's get right to it. Please welcome Marcy Phelps and your host, private investigator, Matt Spare. And welcome everybody to this week's episode of PI Perspective. This is Matt Spare, your host. Today, I am incredibly, incredibly honored to uh, welcome a librarian, an awesome librarian and an awesome researcher and uh, just somebody who, who really, really loves her craft and is very good at it. Uh, I wanna welcome Marcy Phelps to the program. Marcy, how are you? I'm doing well, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming on board. This is great. Um, so like I had mentioned earlier, you, you're a librarian originally, and uh, you found your way into researching. So you're, you're just like Cynthia Hetherington a little bit, right? <laughs> you kind of found your way bit. into her kindred <laughs> spirits, right? <laughs> well, big shoes to fill. Big yeah. stilettos to big fill. Big stilettos, <laughs> yes, definitely. So tell me a little bit more about your background. How did you get into this business and... Uh, what, what are you doing these days? Well, I actually have, uh, I, as you mentioned, I'm a librarian. Um, I uh, completed my uh, master's in library science in 2000, and I had been um, working in a small uh, university library uh, just long enough to realize that I really was better suited to uh, for being self-employed. And um, during the uh, last part of my um, master's program, I was approached by a couple of people I met through the program who um, asked me to do some subcontracting work for them, um, research-based. I was always into the, I was a reference librarian. So databases was my thing. Right. And um, um, so I, I, so I was working from home, uh, making um, much better money than I was making in the library and working with some awesome projects. I said, well, if they'll pay me to stay home and do research, who else will? And um, so I started my business um, straight out of grad school in 2000. Right. And I uh, worked mostly with marketing professionals, digging into people, companies, industries. So like due diligence type of stuff? Uh, due diligence, marketing, um, intelligence, just gathering what they know so they can work on their positioning and their branding and nice. uh, get smart. So uh, basically doing uh, research and um, with uh, databases, phone, and getting out and talking to people as well. And... Um, I was humming along with that pretty well for um, several years. And then um, a private investigator reach out, reached out to me, bless his heart, Chuck Sullivan from okay. Colorado. Sure. And um, 
he uh, asked me if I'd be interested in doing some um, news and social media research for him. He had a, a subcontractor who was retiring. And so I took over and uh, loved the work. And uh, Chuck encouraged me about that time. I was in Colorado then. Um, um, after not having licensing for a while, Colorado uh, started um, their licensing back up. And, and it was about six was years ago, I think, right? 2015. 2015. So, um, so I, I did get my PI license then, and Chuck um, did teach me quite a bit. And then when he retired, I um, just expanded my client base within the, I just hit the ground learning. Yep. Um, I, I'm incredibly thankful uh, to this profession because it has the most incredibly smart and generous people who um, I just uh, learned um, beyond what Chuck taught me. I just learned a lot and um, branched out. And now um, I'm in North Carolina now and licensed here as a PI. I'm a certified fraud examiner and I specialize in, um, I do a lot of due diligence background investigations for sure. pre-investment. Um, I do asset investigations um, for judgment enforcement and divorce cases. I work with some attorneys on the um, civil, civil side of it. And, um, and then I have my training business. I do online training in research. That's great. That's great. And, and we're going to focus later on, um, on asset searches. Uh, you did okay. great teaching for Nally and, um, you know, I asked you to come on and just hit the bullet points of, of what that was about. And, um, you know, if, if folks don't know who Marcy is, like, she's got a great blog, um, where there's tons of material that, that you put out you obviously like to write and you're, you're good at it. And, uh, I, I've definitely learned a thing or two and, um, it's, it's things that have been featured in investigators toolbox. I've definitely have pulled a bunch of blogs and, and, uh, put them in the library there because I, I feel that you really do have that passion for training and uh, you've got that whole other project too, that we'll, uh, we'll get in. You, you, you actually, um, you do training, right? You, you have, uh, classes and uh, online courses available. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, I, I have always, um, I'm actually a teacher by training. Um, and um, I've always wanted to incorporate teaching into my business. And I'm, I have the opportunity through the Illumio uh, platform. It's I L L E L E. I L L U M E O, lumio.com. And they're wonderful people over there, and they host my uh, courses. I have courses in um, due diligence background investigations, um, asset investigations, and then I go into some more detailed research like uh, public records, court searching. And, um, and then I have one that kind of takes you into the um, head of a researcher. Um, my husband would say that's a scary spot to yeah. be. <laughs> um, and I kind of take you through my research process, which you can apply to any kind of investigation or research mm -hmm. uh, project. So I know it's so intimidating when you're getting started and doing this kind of work, you know, when, you know, obviously you get an email from a client who's looking to have something done and it's like, okay, where do I begin? And, um, you know, I, I always try and preach methodology, right? Have a check sheet, have a, just a game plan of um, knowing where to look and how to look. And I think that's, that's one of the things that you, uh, you focus on. Um, what, what type of recommendations would you also give to folks that are, just getting into this type of work? Um, as far as becoming a PI? 
no, I mean, research. Yeah, well, more, more research, you know, as a PI doing research, because uh, I think, oh. you know, we get contacted all the time, <laughs> searches, you know, find this person, lost relative, you know, lost client, you name it, and we get it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think when it comes to research, um, I think the most important thing is to understand uh, the why. I talk about that a lot. Why are you doing this research? What is the client going to do with the information once they have it? Are they going to court? Or is this something just preliminary? Uh, because I think that's going to affect your approach, your um, methodology, your sources. Um, and uh, so I, probably the biggest part of my job is figuring out what the client really needs. Yeah, those are so important. When you first get those emails, like you <laughs> could follow up and have a conversation with, or at least shoot an email back, right? I need to understand why you need this information. Don't ever assume anything. Uh, I was having a conversation re recently with Mike Doors about this, right? Um, oh. I, I, have, I have Mike training one of my people and, uh, you know, it's like, why do you need that information? Well, it's pretty self-evident, Mike. I mean, this is, I'm working with attorneys, like, duh. He's like, no, not duh. Like, you need to really dig in and, and understand because they may have other areas or other pockets of information that would be helpful to you when you are start doing the research or point you in the right direction. And, you know, I think like a business owner, I don't think like a researcher. So I'm like, okay, all right, well, that makes sense. Okay, here you go, right? Well, very similar actually and um but i did learn this skill as a librarian uh, on the reference desk <laughs> i have to say right. um getting getting to what people really need um what they're going to do with it and um, making sure you're going giving them the right uh direction right. um my second piece of advice is to uh go beyond um google of course, and go beyond your investigative databases. Sure. When I start talking databases, private investigators always assume I mean TLO, tracers, and that kind of database. And yes, that is part of the toolbox. Um, but there are so many other databases out there. And um, so I guess you really wouldn't consider me, maybe I'm not open, totally an open source person because that's, that's sort of a debate. Are, are yeah. premium databases open source or not? Right. Um, but I use premium databases um, just about all the time. It is a rare case where I'm not... Um, you know, just using multiple, multiple sources. And um, so here, here's the thing about premium databases. I, and, and by premium, we mean just subscription based, right? You're paying a fee for access to information. They're so important because they're, they're basically helping you with your pedigree information. They're helping you establish points of data, right? And from there, you can substantiate and and you know or, or knock things off the list right cross out the white noise so i always preach the trinity right you, you know finding at least three data points that mm -hmm. that are three different places are saying the, the same thing there's a pretty good chance that that's that's correct information um but really that that's the gist of it right if you're not using one of these premium databases or if you're only using one you may not be doing as thorough as you think you are uh, absolutely. And, um, and, and as I said, you need to get beyond the, the TLO and tracers um, and go to the news sources. Um, and um, I use, um, I personally use um, several premium databases for news. I use uh, LexisNexis, of course, they're the big one. I use um, uh, Dow Jones Factiva, because they have that, Do that Dow Jones content that you won't find anywhere else. And with my corporate 
stuff that's important. Sure. And then uh, ProQuest Dialogue, which goes back to my librarian days, but um, I always find something in there that I don't find anywhere else, like a 1982 news article um, that mentioned the business partnership of, between two people who weren't supposed to be connected. Right. You know, so. It's always um, interesting. You know, you can, you can find that stuff. And it's, you know, we, I think we get lazy or complacent, you know, and then we figure that, um, yeah, we've done enough. That's always the other question too, right? How much is enough? Uh, stuff, right? I did a blog post <laughs> on that. You did, you did. I read it. It was great. <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to jump in. Uh, actually, we're going to take a break here. And when we come back, we're, I really want to uh, just start you know, diving into, you know, acid searching and, and uh, get some tips from you, maybe some common mistakes that, that folks made. Um, so everybody sit tight and we'll be right back. Are you a member of NCISS? Do you know what this great organization does? The National Council of Investigation and Security Services was formed in 1975 to keep a watchful eye on legislation that affects our industry. Now more than ever, there are data privacy and DMV issues popping up all over the country. Consider joining and supporting this much needed watchdog for our industry. Learn more at NCISS.org. In 2019, Investigation Education Consultants added a new affiliate in its never-ending quest to provide quality professional investigative training. IEC is now offering certificate courses and investigative training online. Our website, IECOIT.com, will soon offer a certificate in professional investigation for those interested in entering the investigative field. There'll be standalone investigation classes for those seeking continuing education credits, CEUs, or just interested in taking classes for their own personal or professional interests. The classes currently available are Foundations of Investigation, Legal Investigation, Criminal Investigation, Fraud Investigation, Background Investigation, Interviews and Statements, Skip Tracing Locates, Ethics, and Report Writing. Investigator Toolbox members will receive a 20% discount off the listed price. So visit IECOIT.com. Check out the latest issue of PI Magazine, available online or via hard copy. Visit PIMagazine.com to learn more. And welcome back to PI Perspectives. This is Matt Sperry, your host. Today we have the amazing Marcy Phelps on our, the program. We're talking asset searches. We're finding money. We're looking for housing. We're, we're doing whatever. So uh, Marcy, w welcome back to the program. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. So, um, you know, this whole thing about, uh, you know, finding assets and locating things you know, before the break, we had talked about, you know, when is... When is enough enough? And you had mentioned a blog um, about doing that stuff. So, so tell me a little bit about that. When, when, in, do you, in your opinion, when do you think the due diligence is there? When have you hit the mark? Uh, again, it goes back to well, first of all, budget. Mm -hmm. um, when you run out of budget, you either have to go back for more or end it right there. Um, tie up your loose ends. Um, Another thing is, again, you're keeping in mind the why and exactly what the client really, what would help them answer their questions. What were the original questions and needs? Um, another thing that I like is, uh, that tells me I've been at this way too long is if when you start seeing the same uh, information over and over again. So... Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of tells me it's time to uh, call it a day. Yeah, and, and you know, I think one of the mistakes that folks do make is is not going back and asking for more budget, right? Because you, you you know, someone will call you and say, "How much is it going to cost to do this?" And I, mm -hmm. I hate when I get those <laughs> those things, you know, because I never want to be pinned down to something. I'm like, I don't know, you know, this is what our hourly is. Figured uh -huh. you know, it'll take so many hours on doing this give or take, but it could be more. Um, and, and on your retainers, you know, just spelling that out, right? The initial investigative work will be at this rate and, you know, subject to additional, right? And Absolutely. sometimes we got to put language in there that we'll consult 
with, with the client before that budget is spent, but some understand and they're like, okay, if it takes more time, I understand. And they'd rather have it right. You know, if you're getting close to where you need to be, you're spending a few more dollars, to, nine times out of 10, they're going to do it. Well, I do not charge by the hour. Mm. Um, I made that one a rule a long time ago. Um, so I charge a fixed fee. Mm. And uh, when, when there's uncertainty, we'll do a phased approach and do a, a quick first pass, but then it'll be a base, a fixed fee for that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you, you kind of have to build, when you work on a fixed fee, you kind of, um, you know when to stop. <laughs> yeah. You know, I say hourly, but I'm really a fixed fee too. <laughs> because oh, I give, good. I give okay. I was yeah. getting a little worried. No, no, I give them minimums. You know, it's like a two hour minimum. But we have our minimum. hourly yeah. rate here yeah. in our head. Yep. Um, and we know when we've spent too much time. But also, like I said, when we're, we're getting beyond what the client's questions are yes. and we're getting the same information or lack of information. So, so what do you do with premium database charges and everything like that? Do you itemize that or do you add it into your pricing? That's just part of my pricing yeah. and my, my, my mental hourly rate. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah, so so I've seen it done both ways. I'm, I do it the way you do it. I don't line item um, <clears throat> research charges, but I've seen people that that have, that have done that. Like they charge an additional fee. They do their their hourly research rate, and then they'll do an additional um, additional fee on um, you know their their database costs. If my clients need it for their accounting, I'm you know I'm always flexible. Sure, but. But I really do hate counting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're a library, not an accountant, darn it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Gotcha. Oh, that's funny. Um, so, um, yeah, we talked about you know, where to start and how to jump in here. Um, let's talk specifically about, like, judgment collection. Let's say an attorney contacts you and says, I have a judgment for $80,000, and mm -hmm. I need to collect on this judgment. How can you help me? How would you suggest somebody would start? Well, uh, the the first thing I recommend is is if it's not too late, is to not um, make the party the the debtor um, aware that you're you're getting serious about collecting on this judgment. A lot of times the attorney will go in and start with subpoenas and, you know, um, hearings and all that. And um, it just um, puts the debtor on high alert and um, they'll sometimes start uh, hiding their assets or transferring. So my first recommendation is uh, let's lay low for a little bit and um, do some preliminary um, investigating uh, and see if it's even worth pursuing um, if they don't have any money. If they really don't have any assets, um, you may not want to pursue this. Um, so we usually start with a preliminary investigation and then we... Um, we cover several points, and I think I covered all of those in that Nally um, presentation. Um, but we, you know, obviously you, um, you're you looking um, at assets. You're also looking at liabilities in this phase. Um, you're looking for related businesses. It's very important. What I call in the first part of my preliminary research is gathering names, just names of um, aliases, um, related um, individuals, uh, businesses. It's very important to um, gather all those names um, so that I can have my um, terms to search with f later on when I go into the 
public records for assets and liabilities, court searching, um, news and social media, um, because there's a lot that's not in the public record. Sure. Um, I think an important and, and, and an important part of asset research is to um, look for any kind of fraudulent um, conveyance of property or businesses. Um, so I think that's where online research really comes into uh, play because that's not always going to show up on the um, balance sheet. So, right. yeah, um, so, so just to clarify that, so you've got somebody who's got a corporation, that corporation's getting sued. There's a judgment against that corporation. They dissolve the corporation and open up a new corporation and say, oh, you've got a judgment against, you know, Marcy Phelps and sons, but you know, Marcy Phelps and daughters is open down. That's who we're, we're in business as. So, you know, we don't owe that money because Marcy Phelps and sons went out, out of business. Right. So that's that false conveyance where, where they're they're They know that they're, <laughs> there's a judgment against them. They willingly know that there's, there's litigation that they owe money and they're setting up a new corporation. Right. Did I get that right? Uh, that's, that is definitely part of it. There's also a legal, um, fraudulent uh, transfer of property, um, the, you know, transferring the condo to your son's name right. yeah. and, and that kind of stuff as well. Um, um, so that's an important part of the asset investigation. And, and then um, a lot of, you know, when we're doing asset investigations for individuals, uh, people will say, well, why are you looking at the corporations that's protected by the individual from the pr individuals? Um, you got to pierce the veil. That's what they say. <laughs> pierce the veil. Pierce I the love veil. that expression. Right. And so that's an important part of the asset uh, investigator's job is to look for any, any kind of fraud uh, related to these um, to the um, corporation itself is, you know, is it a real corporation? Is it a shell? Um, was it transferred, as you say, illegally um, or, or a new court uh, dissolved? Right. Uh, so that information is very val valuable for the attorneys for piercing the corporate veil. So the, the other thing also that I always suggest to look for is looking for liens and judgments and all that. So if, if somebody owns tax, will they owe taxes like federal taxes or state taxes, or there's prior judgments, like your client's got to wait in line for all that stuff. Like the government's <laughs> got to get paid first and you, know, you want them to know about that. Right. Absolutely. That's, and that's one of the big, um, mistakes with asset investigations is they forget the liabilities um, because they could have a million dollars in assets, but, you know, two million in liabilities, like you say, wait in line. Um, the other good thing about these liabilities is that they lead to assets. They yeah. give us clues. So you don't like the um, uniform commercial code. UCC. Uh, yep. The UCC filing will will give you a lead to some business property or, yeah. you know. What's collateral? Or, what, did, what did they put up to get the, to obtain that? So you're how they. And, and and names too. This is part of the gathering names, um, the financial institution, mm -hmm. any partnerships. Uh, yeah, I know. Like when we're looking for for properties, um, you know, who owns a property? One of the things I always suggest is to look at the mortgage. And mm -hmm. you, first of all, you want to find out what are the terms of the mortgage, right? How long have they owned that property? How much equity? is potentially built into that property. How much money did they put down? Like, these are all things that, that if you're looking at that instrument, the mortgage instrument, you, you can, you can tell it says, it says it shows it. Um, the other thing is, is <clears throat> who do you subpoena for insurance, insurance information, right? Is that property insured? Well, most mortgage companies require, um, probably all of them require that you to have home homeowners insurance or some sort of building insurance when you take out the mortgage. Right. They have that information. It may not be in that particular instrument, but they have 
the information, right? So now you know who to subpoena. If you get, you're getting a, you know, nobody was responding to a, a lawsuit or, or something like that. It, it's just a little, little thing you can tag onto and maybe potentially develop more information, right? Lots of clues, lots of clues in public records. Um, that's why I like them so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they're such a pain to search. Yeah. Yeah, well, a lot easier these days. Imagine if it was like in the seventies, <laughs> you know, like microfiche going in. Been you know, there, like, done that. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least now it's you know things are getting online, uh, which makes things a little bit easier, a, a little bit to to, to service. Um, what are some other tips you can give uh, the researchers out there? Uh, the news and social media. Um, don't forget that. I, and, I, and I really, I think this is an underutilized resource a lot. Um, I, this is where, you know, I, I found out that our subject was leaving for Costa Rica that week. You know, um, you'll right. never find that in the, um, in the um, court records or, or property records or anything. So um, I just really am, that's kind of my favorite part of this whole thing <laughs> is the news and social media. And then um, I go really free form on the uh, web searching and I start throwing in um, you know, all those names that I've accumulated sure. um, along the way. And um, it, I, I start getting creative with Google at that point, um, you know, switching order of your keywords and uh, going into Google. Oh, this is one of my favorite places for uh, asset investigations is Google Images. Mm -hmm. um, I am surprised that I find things through Google Images that are not in the regular Google web search database. Or maybe it's just buried too far in there that I don't find them. But pictures of assets of uh, someone's Bentley collection. Oh, sure. I, 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 you know, I, I found nothing like that anywhere until I searched um, in, um, did my uh, Google images search. So yeah, that's great. Uh, so you have to kind of pull out all the stops sometimes and just get really creative. I think creativity that's what I really like about asset investigations is you, you have to use your creativity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I think it's also important to um, be a part of associations, right? National associations, state associations, uh -huh. folks that, that you know, certify fraud examiners, you know, being part of those associations where when you hit the wall, you have peers now to bounce things off of, right? I've tried this, that, this, and that, and I'm not getting anywhere. Does anybody have any ideas? of where I could additionally go or training, right? Uh, folks like yourself that are out there, you know, this is how you do it. This is a proper way to do it. I, I think you can't discount the importance of that, right? I, 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 I say this a lot. Um, the uh, private investigators, uh, biggest asset is their network. Yep. And um, I don't know where I'd be without my professional associations. Um, like you say, you know, if I need um, some just, you know, to bounce ideas off of, or um, I need um, help with court searching in another state. Um, and I'm a member of um, the Association of Independent Information Professionals, uh, people who own an information business. Yeah. Some of us are PIs, but we have all kinds of people who are really good at information. I think Eddie, Eddie Ajab's in that too, I think. Eddie is, um, I think he's our, he's coming off the board. He, is he? He's been on the board. Um, yeah, he's awesome. Love Eddie. Eddie's great. Um, so that association um, 
I use extensively for um, bouncing ideas off of, but also if I need to, for my due diligence, verify a degree out in the middle of nowhere in uh, Sweden where no one speaks English, there's an AIP member who can help me with that. That's so um, my PI associations, um, yeah, they're great. Right. Um, okay. So I think we're going to wind down here, Marcy. This was great. Thank you so much for coming on. Just giving us a little, a little taste, a little, uh, you know, a little direction here on how to, how to do all this stuff. Um, uh, let's talk about your, your teachings again, because I, you do have a lot of content that that's out there and uh, tell me uh, once again, where folks can find this stuff. Oh, uh, it's, um, Actually, I think the best place to go is my website, marcyphelps.com. Not with an F. And I, I have a training page. Yeah. Um, and I, have, I list all my uh, courses on there and along with a, a, a discount coupon code. Awesome. Do you do any one-on-one so. -on -one training or, or pretty much just all uh, webinars? Oh, I do one-on-one uh, -on -one training. I've done uh, group training um, in person and virtually. Um, and then I do speaking like I did with uh, Nally. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it, it's uh, <laughs> uh, surprisingly, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy it a lot. And it's a way of bringing my joy, passion for teaching into my investigative business. Yeah. And if you haven't uh, caught Marcy speaking anywhere, I highly recommend it. It's uh, lots of information. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, we'll catch everybody next week on the next show. Take care. Thanks to Marcy for jumping on and giving us some quick tips about asset searching. This is a very lucrative field of research if you take your time and learn how to do it right. Consider taking some of her classes. They're very affordable. We'd also like to thank Crosstracks, Investigation Education Consultants, and NCISS. Please support our great supporters. Now, have you thought about joining Investigators Toolbox? Now's the time to get on board and join the fastest growing digital community for investigative professionals. Use code PIP201836 to save 10% on membership. If you have a question or a comment about the show, email Matt at MatthewS at SatellitePI.com. You can also find him on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. We'd like your feedback to bring you the best shows possible. And we'll return next week with a new show. So make sure you tune in and stay safe out there.